The title of our sermon this morning is Liars Judge the Lord of Truth. Liars Judge the Lord of Truth. And we're in part two as we're working through this text, John chapter 18, verses 28 through 38. Now in John chapter 18, the Lord Jesus Christ, to give us the setting here, the Lord Jesus Christ goes out with his disciples from the city of Jerusalem. Over the Kidron Ravine, he ascends the Mount of Olives, and he enters the Garden of Gethsemane. Now there in the Garden, the Lord Jesus Christ is betrayed into the hands of lawless men by Judas. He's arrested, he's bound, he's led away to stand trial before the Jewish leaders. Peter said that he had committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, and yet the intentions of these wicked leaders from the beginning was to put him to death. And that intention was clearly stated in John chapter 11 after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now he first appears before Annas, then he appears before Caiaphas, who was described as the high priest that year, and he had never been charged. The proceedings themselves were in complete defiance of Jewish law, and yet before the night was through, he would stand before the Sanhedrin, judged guilty of blasphemy, and sentenced to death. The Jews were prohibited by Roman law from putting anyone to death without Roman approval. And they led Jesus away then to the Roman praetorium in verse 28 to stand trial before Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. We see then as we come to John chapter 18 now, a convergence or a clash of worldly authorities. The kings of the earth, Psalm 2 says, right, have set themselves, the rulers have taken counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Each one of them pursuing their own sinful, wicked, selfish, prideful agendas. Worldly authorities, religious authorities, jockeying and scrambling for power that ultimately belongs to none of them. And all of this now, as we go through the the chapter, we have to understand is a picture of the lawlessness of men and the degree to which sinful, godless people, the lengths to which they will go to suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. They plot, they lie, they manipulate, they bribe, they extort, they trump up charges, they seek out false witnesses, and all done, according to verse 28, with a defiled heart and a depraved veneer of religiosity. These were obsessively religious people. And these obsessively religious people are crying out for his blood. Pilate, ultimately, doesn't have the integrity and doesn't have the backbone to stand in their way. And both he and the Jews will bear responsibility for murdering the Lord Jesus Christ here. Now, in the midst of all the lies, in the midst of all the manipulation, in great contrast against the black backdrop of all their wickedness and all their sin stands the sinless and blameless and spotless Son of God. Worthy of all honor, worthy of all praise, worthy of all majesty and glory, and yet here despised, humiliated, mocked, beaten, spit upon, scourged, and finally crucified. This is a picture of man's depravity. And it's also a picture of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that truth, incidentally, he says, is why he came. As he stands before Pilate in verse 37, he says to Pilate, You rightly say that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. He is the king of kings. Amen? He is the Lord of Lords who came into this lying, deceitful world to proclaim the truth. Now that contrast between the lies of this world and the Lord of truth, the truth of God in Christ, is a primary theme woven throughout the very fabric of this passage. The Holy Spirit, through the pen of John, intends for us to see that contrast, to consider that contrast. So as we consider point two then on your notes in your bulletin, the Lord of truth in verses 32 through 38. As we work through these verses, I want you to see four characteristics of the truth, four points regarding the truth that we can learn from our passage. The first of those four is this, the truth doesn't come from you. I 
to many in our day and age, that would surprise them to know that. The truth doesn't come from you. It doesn't originate within your heart. It doesn't originate within your head. Truth is not what you make it. It's not what you feel it to be. It doesn't vary from person to person based on what someone believes. Something isn't true simply because it's true to you. It's either true or it's false. Truth exists outside of you. (laughs) Truth has been determined and it has been determined without you, without your help. Truth is absolute. There is such a thing as absolute truth. In John chapter 18, the Jews have their own agenda, right? Rather than pursue the truth, weigh the evidence, seek understanding, they lie and they manipulate and they bribe and they murder to pursue what's best for them, to pursue their own interests, their own desires. Pilate has his own agenda. The Romans have their own agenda. The people in the crowd who will cry out for blood, they have their own agenda. Meanwhile, all the while, the truth has already been determined. The truth has already been decreed. It is working out exactly according to plan, according to the truth. Look at verse 31. They want to put Jesus to death, And Pilate essentially gives them permission. He says in verse 31, Pilate said to them, you take him, you judge him according to your law. Now the reason, the reason that the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Look at verse 32. Is so that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Now make the connection with me, right? In the middle of all the chaos, in the midst of all these competing agendas, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes, God is behind it all. And God providentially working all things toward their intended ends according to his sovereign decree. The Jews, the Jews could have skirted Roman law. The Jews could have, as they had done to Stephen in Acts chapter 7, the Jews could have stoned the Lord Jesus Christ to death. That would have been expected for someone accused of blasphemy. It was stated in their own law that someone accused of blasphemy would would be put to death by stoning. But Pilate here is essentially giving them permission to go and do it in verse 31. But the Jews are going to press for this Roman approval. They're going to press for crucifixion. On their part... They want him to be seen as cursed. Deuteronomy has said that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. On Pilate's part, in order to quell civil unrest, to quell the disruption, and to keep his job, Pilate would eventually consent to the Lord's death and send him to be crucified. The people, right, the people on their part, incited by the Jewish leaders, they have their own reasons to cry out for his crucifixion. Ultimately, Jesus Christ will be crucified. Why? Why is that? According to verse 32, because behind it all, behind it all, the Jews aren't determining the truth. Pilate isn't the arbiter of truth. Truth isn't determined by mob majority. Truth has been determined already. All of this came about exactly according to the perfect plans and purposes of Almighty God. Verse 32, that the saying of Jesus Christ might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. John, or Jesus had made it clear in John chapter 12, signifying by what death he would die. That he would not be cast down and stoned to death, but that he would be raised up like the serpent in the wilderness, right? That he would be raised up and be crucified. Having been raised up, that he would draw all kinds of people to himself. People out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. And because he declared it, it is true. Because he declared it, it's true. If the Jews had stoned the Lord, and think with me, If they had succeeded in killing him, one of the many times that they had attempted to kill him before, if Pilate had not ordered his death, if Pilate had not consented to his crucifixion, then the word of God is not true. Jesus Christ is not the son of God and our faith is in vain. You can go home today and live your life as you see fit, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. 
right? But all of this, all of this must happen. And it must happen exactly as the Lord Jesus Christ has said that it would happen, or he's not sovereign. Truth does not reside with you. It originates with God. And God ordains all things that come to pass. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Truth, truth doesn't come from science. Truth does not come from science. Science is not a determiner of truth. Science is not a source of of truth. At best, science is a created order revealer of truth. The heavens declare the glory of God, the psalmist says. The firmament shows his handiwork. Paul essentially says in Romans 1, what may be known of God, what may be known of God has been revealed or manifested to us. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. His invisible attributes, even his eternal Godhead, understood by the things that are made. So where do our natural laws come from? Our natural laws created by God to reveal a God of order, the God of the universe. What is the source of all the order in our universe? Who determined the speed of light? Who made E to equal MC squared? Who did that? God did that. When you make science, not a revealer of truth, but when you make science the source or the determiner of truth, Paul says in Romans 1 that you change the glory of the incorruptible God into something that looks like it was made by man. And you end up worshiping and serving the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Truth is not determined by science. Truth is not determined by psychology. Truth is not determined by philosophy. Contrary to what Disney continuously indoctrinates people with, you don't find truth by pursuing your own heart. <laughs> you think about it. Atheistic, atheistic scientists are like ants in an ant farm. Right? They sit there in their glass enclosed ant farm the sand around it, and the, the atheistic ant scientist says to himself, everything we see here has come from nothing, right? The this, this sand must be eternal. <laughs> and God asked Job in chapter 38, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. He asked Job, where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may know its paths to its home. Job, do you know it because you were born then? Or because the number of your days is great? God sits in the heavens and he laughs, holds them in derision. The Big Bang, right? Darwinian evolution. Do you know it? Because you were born then? Or because the number of your days is great? Worldly wisdom. What about professing Christians that deny a literal six-day creation? Do you know it because you were born then? Or because the number of your days is great? Since when is science a source of truth? It is a revealer of truth. Science is not the source of truth. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. The source of truth is God Almighty. And what we know of this world is revealed to us and is to reveal Him in His glory. Isaiah chapter 40. And look down beginning at verse... Six, who is the source of truth? Where does truth come from? In verse six, Isaiah chapter 40, verse six, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? Cry this, all flesh is grass. All its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, the truth of our God stands forever. You are a wisp. You are a vapor. What is this life? What is man that God is even mindful of him? But the truth of God remains forever. O Zion, verse 9, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Look at verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who's done that? The Lord. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor has taught him. With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of justice. Who taught him knowledge? And showed him the way of understanding. God is almighty, omniscient. Look down at verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 41 and drop down to verse 21. These worldly usurpers, those that believe they have knowledge of these things. Verse 21, present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare to us the things to come. Understand in this that God is mocking worldly wisdom, mocking the foolishness of this world. Show the things that are to come hereafter, verse 23, that we may know that you are God's. Incidentally, one of the indications that God is God and that God is the source of all truth is that God knows the end from the beginning. That God has determined all things that come to pass and he knows the future. Incidentally, one of the qualifications of a true prophet is that that true prophet is speaking for God and speaks the truth from God 100% unfailingly, 100% accurately, 100% of the time. And so these lying prophets today that say they have a word from God and that word doesn't come true, God says in Deuteronomy they should die. Right? They are liars. God is true. He says in verse 25, I've raised up one from the north, he shall come. From the rising of the sun, he shall call on my name. He shall come against princes as through mortar, as the potter treads clay. Look at verse, or chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 42. And drop down to verse 5. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Look at chapter 43 and drop down to verse 8. And God says again, mocking worldly wisdom here, bring out the blind people, 43, verse 8. Bring out the blind people who have eyes. You see that? Bring out the blind people who have eyes. And the deaf 
who have ears. In other words, bring out those people who think they understand and they don't. Bring out those that say they know the truth when they don't know the truth. Let all the nations, verse 9, be gathered together. Let all of them be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. I have declared, I have saved, I have proclaimed. There was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he. There is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Look at Isaiah 44. Right, just crushing testimony through the scroll of Isaiah here about who God is. God as the source of truth. God, the source of all knowledge. God, the source of all understanding. Look at Isaiah 44 and drop down to verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. You were created. Amen. You were made. You were formed in the womb by God. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness. He continues to do this today, right? In the face of this world's wisdom, where is the wise of this world, the scribe? Who confirms the word of his servant, performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Before Cyrus was even a flicker in anyone's imagination, he names him by name. And he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Look at Isaiah 46. Look at verse 8. Remember this, the Lord says, show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. One of the characteristics is verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Truth does not originate with you. Truth is not grounded in human opinion. Truth is not based on how you feel, how you think, or how much you think you know. Man did not create himself. Man, not creating himself, did not create or come up with his own morality. And although man constantly tries to change that, to allow for his own wicked desires. Truth comes from outside you. And you are subject, you and I are subject to that truth. There is an objective basis. There is an objective source. Where is that source? God. And God is the source of truth. Now what does that, what does that mean? We think through applications of all this, right? Our understanding of these things. Here's what it means means you don't get to pick what gender you are. God has decided what gender you are. You don't get to decide that it's okay to quote-unquote love someone of the same gender. God has decided that, that is immoral, that is wickedness in his sight. You don't get to think that lusting after that girl in your heart or looking at that filth on the internet is okay. You don't get to think that because God has already determined that that is sexual immorality. God has said that it is adultery. God has said that sexually immoral people have their place in the part, uh, their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Truth doesn't come from you. Truth doesn't come from you. And the truth that doesn't come from you originates the truth, originates with God, and you are accountable to it. You are subject to it. Truth, secondly, 
doesn't come from this world. Truth doesn't come from you. Secondly, truth doesn't come from this world. Look at back at uh, John chapter 18 and look beginning at verse 33. Pilate then entered the praetorium again now and he calls Jesus to himself. He said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Pilate, verse 33, goes back into the praetorium. He calls Jesus, asks him this question, are you the king of the Jews? Literally in the Greek, the word order of the question begins with you. You, Pilate says, you are the king of the Jews? Now it's obvious that this was the charge that was brought forth by the Jewish leaders. They charged him with blasphemy. But when it gets to Pilate, the charge is different. Pilate wouldn't have done anything about a charge of blasphemy. He wasn't going to handle a theological question of the Jews. The Jews now are bringing Jesus to Pilate with the intention of having him executed. And so the Jews manipulate Pilate with a charge here of sedition or insurrection. Luke records in Luke chapter 23 verse 2, says they began to accuse him saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation sedition, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the king. They painted Jesus Christ as a revolutionary, as an insurrectionist. So it's most likely then, if you consider verse 33, it's most likely that Pilate's question here is highly sarcastic. Pilate is shocked. If you imagine the scene, right? Jesus is standing there before him, disheveled. He's bound, having been handed over by his own people. His face is already battered. He's already been struck. His face is swelling now. He's already been cut. There's spattered, dried blood and spit on him. He's obviously destitute, obviously poor. And so to Pilate, standing before Pilate here, this is not a dangerous revolutionary. He doesn't see him as a, as a threat. He essentially says, you're the one who has everybody so worked up? right? You, a criminal in the eyes of your own people, you're the one that came riding into town at the beginning of the week to the shouts of Hosanna. This is absurd. You are the king of the Jews? That's the idea of what's going on here with Pilate's question. Isaiah affirms this, doesn't he? He describes Jesus as having no form or comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised. He's rejected of men. You are king of the Jews, Pilate asks. At any point in this process, Jesus could command a halt to the whole ordeal, right? He could call down 12 legions of angels. He could call down fire from out of heaven. I am the king, Jesus could say, and judge there and then the Jews, judge Pilate, judge the world, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't come to get out of this He hasn't come this time to judge the world. He's come at this time to lay down his life for those that would repent and believe in the gospel. Now he's certainly the king, but not in the way that any of these wicked men could have imagined. That truth, that understanding is not of this world. That truth is spiritually discerned. So Jesus answers him then in verse 34. Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? In other words, is that your understanding, Pilate? Or did you simply get that from my enemies? Do you believe, Pilate, that I'm a king? Now, Pilate's hard-hearted sarcasm is confirmed in his answer. Pilate answered indignantly, right? Contemptuously. Am I a Jew? It's essentially what Pilate said. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you, betrayed you to me. What have you done? Pilate's answer in verse 35 reveals the contempt that he has for the Jews. Am I a Jew? Do you think I care in the slightest what you people think about anything? Pilate is saying. Or what authority structures you put in place? I'm the real authority here. You've obviously angered them. Your own people, your own leaders have delivered you or betrayed you over to me. What have you done? Pilate asks. So the Lord answers in verse 36. Answer, very interesting. My kingdom is not of this world. It is otherworldly. 
If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now through this answer, Jesus is communicating a truth to Pilate. He's also communicating a truth that is true for us today. This is the way that things really are, Pilate. Not as you see them to be, not as they appear to you to be, but this is the way that things really are. There is a truth far beyond what you perceive. Jesus certainly doesn't look the part. Jesus doesn't come at the command of an army. Pilate would have known about his rebuke of Peter in the garden, right? For pulling his sword, cutting off Malchus's ear. Pilate would have heard about Jesus healing Malchus's ear. He would have heard about the Lord offering himself up to be arrested, offering himself up to be bound. But Jesus Christ didn't come to fight his way into a kingdom. He has come to win for himself at the cross of people, to sacrifice himself for them in death, to take upon himself their sin, to take upon himself the wrath that is reserved for them. And then to gather his own from the four corners of the earth. To gather those into his kingdom that belong there. Those who will repent. Those who will believe. Those who will turn from their sin to trust him alone. Now that, the truth of that exists outside of this world. You can't find it through natural revelation. You can't find it by looking at the stars looking at creation, by looking at science. The truth of this exists beyond the understanding of Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. It's beyond the understanding of the Jews who right now are wrapped up murderously in false religion, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They are blinded. This truth must be supernaturally revealed. And here's the truth. One, we've established that truth doesn't come from you. Truth doesn't come from Pilate. Truth isn't established by these lying Pharisees. Truth isn't arrived at through multitudes of false witnesses through the centuries that make claims about the way that they think something should be. Truth isn't determined by any of that. Truth is determined by the one who is standing before Pilate. Secondly, truth doesn't ultimately come from this world. That which is naturally revealed through creation is not sufficient. That which you naturally think in that brain tissue between your ears is not sufficient. That which you think in your heart, which the Bible describes as desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, is not sufficient. My kingdom, the kingdom of truth, is not of this world, Jesus said. This world functions according to a a determined truth, a truth that has already been determined. The word there for world is cosmos. It means created order. It means orderly, well-ordered. It's talking about the created order. This world was created to reveal truth to a degree in the created order that we see, but this created world is not the source or the determiner or the arbiter of truth. All of this creation operates within a system of truth that has been determined. That means there's truth outside of what you see, outside of what you hear, outside of what you taste, what you feel. And that truth, that truth must be supernaturally revealed to you. The fullness of that truth isn't attainable through what you see, what you think, what you think you know. It must be revealed. Knowledge of this world will not get you there. There is a world. There is a realm beyond this one. If you look at the the end of that verse, not from here, that word literally means realm, not from this realm. It must be supernaturally revealed. So as Pilate stood there, picture the scene, right? As Pilate stood there, he represented the Roman government that presented Caesar as a god and presented a pantheon of gods that were supernaturally revealed to the Romans? (laughs) No. They were figments of men's imaginations, right? Invented out of thin air by the wicked whims and imaginations of men. Now, Paul had come across a circumstance very similar in Acts chapter 17. Turn to Acts 17 with me. Paul had come across that kind of worldly paganism on Mars Hill. 
in Athens as he preached to the pagan Greeks there. In Acts chapter 17... Look beginning at verse 22. So Paul, in Athens, in the midst of the Areopagus, he stood and said, verse 22, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, all of these pagan idols, he says, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, The one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things." And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord. You were created to glorify God. When Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, you fell in Adam. All those who are born on earth are born in Adam. You are born in sin. David said, in sin my mother conceived me. From that point in time, you having sinned in Adam will either glorify God in your damnation as punishment for your sin or you will glorify God by turning from your sin, seeking him in Christ, the one who is delivered over for your transgressions. You will glorify God by turning from your sin and worshiping him. You should seek the Lord, verse 27, in the hope that you might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You're hearing his word preached this morning. You have a Bible in your hands. He's not far from you. For in him, verse 28, it's in him, not in science, not in psychology, not in the philosophies of this world, not in yourself, not in your family not in school, not in your career. In him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, verse 29, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature, that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent, to turn from your sin. Repentance doesn't merely mean asking for forgiveness. You can't simply ask for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness is meaningless apart from genuine repentance. If I came up to you and slugged you in the arm and I said, please forgive me, And maybe you being a charitable person might say, oh, I forgive you. So then I slug you in the arm again. And I say, please forgive me. And you being loving and somewhat patient, say, I forgive you. So I slug you in the arm again. Eventually, what are you going to say to me? Listen, if you were really sorry, you would stop slugging me in the arm. (laughs) You cannot presume To live in your sin and just think that God is going to wipe your sin under the rug and just willy-nilly forgive you. You must turn from living life for yourself. You must turn from your sin and you must trust Christ. Sell out for Christ. Live wholeheartedly for him. You must repent. And God commands, verse 30, he commands all men everywhere to repent because, verse 31, he has appointed a day on which he will judge this world in righteousness by the man who is standing before Pilate, being judged by wicked men. By the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by what? By raising him from the dead. Our Lord has been raised from the dead. Buddha has not been raised from the dead. Muhammad is dead. 
Krishna is dead. Our Lord has been raised from the dead. God has given proof, assurance to you that you will stand before him in judgment. You will be accountable to the truth of God. And the proof that you will stand before him in judgment and be held accountable for how you live according to that truth, the proof of that is that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. The truth is not of this world. And you will never come to the truth apart from the one who is truth. The kingdom over which Jesus rules and reigns is not on a mere natural level. It's not merely carnal. It's spiritual. The kingdoms of this world are led by finite men and he is infinite. His kingdom is Unchanging. The kingdoms of this world are often unjust. They're cruel. They're inconsistent. They're weak. They're vacillating. Our quote unquote kingdom here is weak and vacillating and unjust. The kingdoms of this world have boundaries, they have limitations, they come and go. Where is the Roman Empire today? It's gone. His kingdom is eternal, it lasts forever. The kingdoms of this world are ravaged by sin. And sin has and will at last bring down every one of the kingdoms of this world, including our own. His kingdom is perfect, not admitting anything that defiles. The only kingdom that will last is the one where our perfect God rules and reigns, where there is no sin The only way to come to that truth, the only way to come to that kingdom is by pursuing the revelation of it in the way, the truth, and the life. And that revealed by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. Three, that truth isn't spread by force. Back in John chapter 18, verse 36, it isn't spread by force. It's not propagated at the point of a sword. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, My servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. That kingdom is not a political force. It's not a military force. It's not an economic force. It's not a natural force. The kingdom of God is spread, built, superintended, not by natural means, not by human means. You can't persuade your way in. You can't persuade others in. You can't market it. You can't advertise it. You can't manipulate it forward. Jesus says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. What does that say about Islam? Everywhere that Islam is, it is a ravaging, despicable chaos. It's pressed forward at the point of a sword. Everywhere, everywhere that Islam is, it's a disruption. (laughs) Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. So how is this truth then revealed? How is the truth revealed? How is his kingdom pressed forward into this dark world? It's preached. It's preached through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that preaching is by God's grace, redemptive. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus says that unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man is born again. All this would have been enormously important to make clear regarding Jesus Christ to a Jewish audience, right? If his claims were to be believed by a Jewish audience, his kingship would have to be clarified. We can see an example of this in Colossians 1. Turn there with me quickly. His kingship would have to be clarified. In Colossians 1, Paul says in verse 13, that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So what's the difference? This kingdom is described here by Paul in Colossians 1. It's not pressed forward by military force or political force. What's the difference between all of this evidence, right? All of this kingdom talk. What's the difference between all of that evidence in the ears of his disciples who believe and in the ears of Pilate, who's obviously hard-hearted, in the ears of the Jews who are obviously hard-hearted. Maybe in your ears this morning, if you're sitting there hard-hearted. What's the difference? Why is it that brothers and sisters in this church have sold out for Christ, lost family, lost jobs, preached and have lost spouses, have left this world, who go out bearing the reproach of Christ to preach the gospel. Why would a genuine Christian do that? And why would all other false pretender Christians stay at home? Why is it that this world doesn't believe? Why is that? Look at with me at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. What's the difference here? If you're here this morning, to this point, maybe you've not turned from your sin. Maybe this just sounds like a bunch of nonsense to you. You don't get it. You've never repented. You don't follow Christ. You live life for yourself and you know it. You're in your sin. You recognize that. Why is it that all that evidence falls on your deaf ears, falls and bounces off your heart, your concrete heart, but to others it penetrates their heart, turns them from their sin, revels, glories in Christ. Why is that? Look at Matthew chapter 13. On the same day, verse 1, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and he sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spoke many things to them in a parable, in parables saying, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And I want to explain this as we're going through. The one sowing is sowing the word of God. The message, the proclamation of the kingdom, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's preaching the gospel. And as he sows seed, sows the gospel. You go out and you preach the gospel. You preach the gospel to every creature. You preach the gospel without favoritism, without partiality. You just preach the gospel and people are going to respond in various ways. Here how, here's how they're going to respond. Verse 4. As he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. He would later say that those birds represent Satan. The evil one comes and devours that seed so that you will not hear. Five, some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up. They immediately looked like a Christian, but because they had no depth of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. They went out from us because they were not of us, right? Verse seven, some fell among thorns. The thorns, the cares of this world, persecution, the cares of this world, sprang up and choked out the seed. Verse 8, but others fell on good ground, yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And don't harden your heart. Listen to what the Word of God says. Verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Listen, he answered and said to them, verse 11, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. Did you hear what the Lord says? It's been given to them to know. But at this point, to you, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Because seeing 
they do not see. Hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In other words, I speak to them in parables because although they have eyes to see, they refuse to see. Although they have ears to hear, they refuse to hear. You have a heart. But to this point, because your heart has been crusted over, concrete, reinforced around your heart, you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you reject the truth of God, you reject the truth of his kingdom, you reject his right to rule and reign, and you insist on living for yourself and ruling and reigning in your own life. And because you do that, because you are hard-hearted, having eyes to see, you do not see. Having ears to hear, you do not hear. And that's why he preaches in parables. In them, verse 14, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing, you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing, you will see and not perceive. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Listen, the Lord says, verse 16, Blessed are your eyes, for they see. Your ears, for they hear. Brother and sister, blessed are you if you hear, if you understand. If you turn from your sin and sell out for Christ, blessed are you. Because your eyes have seen, your ears have heard. I say to you, verse 17, assuredly, many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. To some, it has been granted. To others, it has not been granted. It is to he who has ears to hear. If you will sit here this morning and you will harden your heart to the truth, if you will sit here this morning and you will stop your ears to the truth, if you will put your hands over your eyes and refuse to see the truth, if you will sit here and in your heart argue with the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will sit here in rebellion against his word, if you will sit here like Pilate, if you will sit here like those Jews who cried out for his blood, if you will sit here like that in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at the preaching of his word, hard-hearted, refusing to hear, refusing to see, then it has not been granted to you and you will die in your sins and you will perish in hell. Turn from your sin. If you think you already know the truth, if you think you got all this figured out, that's your opinion, right? Where did that come from? It came from your own head. Or it came because some wicked godless pagan spoon-fed it to you. It's your own thought, your own opinion. You are blind to the truth. And listen, what's really frightening is that he will judicially, in judgment against you, keep you in your blindness until finally you die and go to hell. It is hidden from those that harden their hearts. Acts chapter 16 verse 14 talks about Lydia. And uh, there it's recorded that God opened the heart of Lydia to understand those things spoken of by Paul. If you're here and you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that desires to turn from your sin, a heart that desires to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, live for the one who made you, who gave you breath. If you have the desire in your heart to unload the weight of all that wicked iniquity, right? The Lord Jesus Christ holds out an offer of the gospel to you. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Cry out to him now. Acknowledge the truth. Turn from your sin. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Truth doesn't come from you. Truth doesn't come from this world. Truth isn't spread by force. Lastly, truth is found only in Jesus Christ. Back in John chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Literally, so then you are a king. Pilate said to him, verse 37. Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Do you hear that? Right? Pilate didn't. Pilate didn't. Do you hear it? Pilate didn't hear it. Do you hear it? Everyone who is of the truth. In other words, born of God. Everyone who is of God. 
everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. There is no truth that exists outside the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no guru somewhere you can go and speak to to find it. You're not going to get it in any other religion. All the religions of this world are the religions of men. Nothing in science will reveal any truth that is in contradiction to or apart from the Lord Jesus Christ who created it. The knowledge of him is where you will find the truth and the truth will set you free. For this cause I was born, the Lord said, to be the king. You rightly say that I'm a king. For this cause I was born. The very purpose for which he was born into the world, verse 37, the very purpose for why he has come to bear witness to the truth, to gather everyone that hears his voice, the very purpose for which he has come is to be king. God has spoken to us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's spoken to us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave his word to the apostles. The spirit of God calls it to their, repent, their remembrance by the spirit of God, inspired, moved by the spirit of God. Men wrote down the scriptures. And we have now the word of God. It attests to us that it is the word of God. It attests to us that it is a sure and perfect revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the truth. To reject this truth is to reject your only hope. This culture is constantly assaulting, constantly assailing that truth. And this truth, the Word of God, revelation of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, has withstood that assault, has withstood that scrutiny for millennia. Christ is the only truth that we can present to our own hearts that is redemptive, the only truth that we can present to this depraved culture. What should we do in light of this truth? Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. What are we to do, brothers and sisters? If you're here today and you're lost, you're in your sin, you know it. Don't harden your heart. Don't turn from the Lord's grace and mercy, his offer to you today. Turn from your sin and follow Christ. Turn from your sin and follow Christ. For those of you, my brothers and sisters, we've turned, we've left uh, this world to follow him. What are we to do? Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, brother, sister, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, brothers and sisters who have gone before us, many who have died for the faith, those that have run their race, now cry out for us to run ours, right? We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. What does he say? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Not just the sin, Right? Certainly lay aside the sin. We're to turn from our sin. And no one can rightly profess to be a Christian that has not turned from their sin. Turn from your sin. Lay aside the sin. But what does he say? Let us lay, lay aside every weight. Everything that hinders. Put it down. Put it down. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the Jews, endured Pilate, endured the humiliation, endured the scourge, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Put down everything that keeps you from running. When you get up in the morning, your feet hit the ground, say, I want to run. I want to run today for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to run and drop everything, push everything out of the way that keeps you from running. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you, God, 
Thank you for this testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his example. The multifaceted diamond that magnificently shines before the heinous and wicked backdrop of sin. I pray that, Lord, for those here that don't know you, that you would give them eyes to see God. Give them ears to hear. Lord, break their heart over their sin. Show them their rebellion. Show them their helplessness apart from Christ. I pray they don't get a minute of sleep. I pray they fear getting in the car. I pray they fear some disease. There are a thousand ways we can be taken out of this world. I pray that you wouldn't give them any rest, Lord, until they turn from their sin to put their faith and trust in you alone. For my brothers and sisters, Lord, I pray that considering all that Christ has done, that we would lay aside every weight, that we would lay aside that sin that so easily ensnares us, and that we would run, that we would run, run all the way to glory. For your everlasting praise and worship, we pray these things in the name of our blessed God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.